This is Janet Deal. I'll be interviewing Miles Kaggins III today for the New York Culture, Kurdish Culture Center. Miles comes from a military family. He achieved the rank of Colonel in the United States Army. During Operation Inherent Resolve, which was the global coalition to defeat Islamic State, Miles was spokesperson working in the communications sector. It was there in Iraq that Miles got to know Kurdish people and began to familiarize himself with Kurdish culture. I know Miles because we're both involved in the New York Kurdish Culture Center. So Miles, thanks for joining me today for this interview. Janet, it is great to join you. Uh, I've been looking forward to talking to you and uh, sharing some of my story with the people who are interested in the New York Kurdish Cultural Center and the story of an American soldier who uh, was sent on a mission overseas and along the way was befriended and embraced and have really gotten to know a whole culture of people around the world, the wonderful Kurds. Miles, there are really, honestly, there are so many things I would love to ask you. And I'm, I think your story is amazing, um, but we are going to limit ourselves in this interview to talking specifically about the Kurdish angle. Um, you got to know Kurdish people while you were with the military in Iraq. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you first made those connections. Yeah, the this is uh, 2023 while we're talking and it's March. And 20 years ago was the invasion of Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. And in April 2003, I was in Iraq in the Diyala province, which is located about two hours northeast of Baghdad. And this is the first time I ever saw a Kurdish person was a Peshmerga, a Kurdish soldier on the road at a checkpoint as we moved in as U.S. forces. And we're told by our intelligence officers and saw some photographs of Kurdish markings on their uniform that do not attack the Kurds, they are not our enemies, and that was all I knew. Fast forward to 2019, I returned to Iraq for my third combat tour there, and I was spokesman for the anti-ISIS coalition. One of my colleagues, a woman named Tanya Paharaziz, is a Kurdish woman from Sulaymaniyah area, and she uh, not only encouraged, but she introduced me more to Kurdish culture. And in my duties as the spokesman, I thought it would be best to try to reach the audiences of people who are affected by Daesh and who were continuing to fight Daesh. And those were Arabic and Kurdish people in Iraq and Syria. I see, okay. Um, did you, did you, how did you seek them out? How did you find them? How did you find Kurdish people to talk to? Well, I was, one of the things that I did most of the time I lived in Baghdad and I, I ran a Twitter handle as the official spokesman. And one of the things I did was, was broaden the reach to audiences by tweeting in multiple languages. Oh. And I found someone who would uh, tweet, uh, write tweets for me in Sarani Kurdish and also in Kermanji Kurdish because we were partnered with Kurds in Syria. And I thought this was instinctively the right thing to do to try to reach audiences, but didn't realize how the Kurdish community appreciated that I was speaking in their languages that were oppressed by either the Turkish, Syrian, uh, Iranian, or federal government of uh, Iraq. And these tweets started to gain more traction and and people started to, the audiences started to have a better feeling about what the coalition was doing. And, and my face was tied to the Twitter handle and that created an opportunity to reach, reach more people through social media and then also television. And things really started to expand in November, 2019, when I traveled to Syria and had a press conference with uh, two gentlemen who were spokesmen for the Syrian Democratic Forces, Mustafa Bali, who's a Kurd from Kobani, and also uh, Kino Gabriel. Kino is a Syriac who is from the Derek area of Syria, and I stood side by side with him talking to international press at a time when the people of 
North and East Syria, Rojava, uh, were quite concerned because President Trump had ordered this withdrawal and repositioning of American troops in Syria pretty, pretty haphazardly was his announcement. And this press conference there on, in Syria, the first of its kind uh, during since the, the war against ISIS, um, started to open more and more doors that have led to our discussion today. Wow, wow. It sounds like a, you chose a, a, a remarkable communication strategy. So um, I just wonder it, wondering, as a Black man, you're a member of an oppressed minority in the United States, and Kurdish people are an oppressed minority in the Middle Eastern countries where, they're, where they live. And I can't help but wonder how much that parallel status has been a motivation to you in forming bonds with Kurdish people and in Kurdish people responding to you. How do, how do you think about that question? The, the, in America, we have these ongoing discussions and I think they will continue to heat up in the um, upcoming presidential cycle about diversity and inclusion. And there, the US military is a, quite a diverse organization just by how we draw from volunteers across the country. But in some instances at higher ranks, you find less and less diversity and uh, more uh, white males, particularly in the military because it's a more male oriented profession anyway. So uh, going back to this press conference that I had in Syria, there were photos on social media and some of the people commenting on the photos quipped that, well, which one of these guys is the American spokesman because they all look like Syrians to me. And so just my phenotype, how I look, created a opportunity to relate closely to people in the Middle East. And additionally, Kurdish people understood oppression in the uh, similar way as Black Americans. In fact, after uh, George Floyd was famously killed by a police officer in the United States um, with the knee on the neck for nine minutes, I received messages from Kurdish people who I'd never met. And these messages would say, Black Lives Matter, and we're here and we support you and you are our brother. And there's a kinship between people across the world who have had to face uh, state-enforced oppression, racism, lack of access to uh, finance, uh, lack of access to voting booths, uh, inability to have full citizenship and uh, hold property, uh, difficulties in climbing the corporate ladder or climbing, ascending to high level government roles, on and on and on, even being picked on and called names or state sanctioned violence against people just because of how they look. So I understand that. Uh, I've lived that a little bit, but my ancestors have lived that fully as my parents grew up in a segregated America and my grandparents and back further lived in sharecropping systems in the South and even slavery a few hundred years ago. Uh, and I respect and identify with many parts of the Kurdish struggle and the Kurdish question that exists today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine if I just tried to put myself in the place of a Kurdish person that um, just a, a dark skinned face would just immediately seem more relatable to me than than maybe some of your the white officers. But maybe that's I don't know. <laughs> I'm just imagining. Anyway, it sounds like but it sounds like you you really it really does contribute to a report, a rapport that you have with Kurdish people. And also a sensitivity. Too. So I, I, I recognize when the Kurds are being treated unfairly. And because of my curiosity, I talk to, I have Kurdish friends around the world, no kidding, Kurdish friends, social media contacts around the world. And I'm asking questions and hearing about the childhoods uh, and some of the experiences uh, that, that people had in Syria growing up and not being allowed to speak Kurdish in schools and only being able to speak Arabic. Um, I know people who have been arrested, uh, expelled to the point where they're now in asylum around the world from, from being political activists in Turkey. 
I know people in Sy um, in Iraqi Kurdistan who have chemical burns on their body from the uh, massacres and attacks from Saddam Hussein's regime on Kurdish people. And I know Kurdish women in Rojalat who have been protesting the oppression of the state there after the unlawful detention and uh, death of Gina Amini. So from these stories, they they inspire me and uh, buoy my further interest in helping the world know about Kurdish culture and maintaining these, these friendships with Kurdish people everywhere. Sounds like you are very well connected in the all across Kurdistan. Um, I'm I'm struck by your mention the allusions to culture that you make. Um, we are both involved with the New York Kurdish Culture Center, which is not explicitly political, although we all have political concerns. But it it concentrates pretty 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 narrowly or not narrowly, but pretty exclusively on on cultural matters, on arts, on religion, on 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 holidays, on festivals, um, and. I just wondered, I, I, I was struck when I, I was listening the other day in preparation for this to another interview you did where you mentioned the importance of, in your work of immersing yourself in, in a culture in order to be able to communicate. And I wondered if that's, if that is connected to why you chose to get involved with the New York Kurdish Culture Center or, or just in general, why is it important to work on culture specifically? When I moved to New York in September 2021, I, I moved here to do a fellowship at the Council on Foreign Relations at Think Tank in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, New York. And I knew some people in the city, but I didn't know, uh, have a large social network. And on my first weekend here, I went to the fifth uh, iteration of the Kurdish Film Festival. And uh, our founder, Kyle Kartal, sent me a premium ticket. And there I was all weekend meeting some new Kurdish friends. And I did not, I was not aware at the time that uh, how well known and well received I was by Kurds in the United States, uh, particularly in New York, as I was new to the area. But the Kurdish community immediately became part of my social and professional network in New York City. And I wanted to maintain involved maintain involvement with Kurdish people, but I want to avoid politics, right? There's, if you spend any time with Kurdish people, you know, you're, the, the, there's going to be a great meal and the conversations about politics. And I have those conversations and I, I try to stay attuned to what's happening politically, but I didn't want to be tied into any particular political groups or movements. And culture is a uh, frame, is an activity that brings people together through music, through dance, through arts, through cinema, television, and language. And those are the spaces where I thought I could bring value to this group and help the group have stronger connections with uh, Americans who support Kurds and access to fundraising for our nonprofit. And I'll continue to be a part as long as the the Kurdish Cultural Center will have me and and really admire the volunteer activities, all the organic grassroots type of volunteer activities that are now starting to bridge cultural divides among Kurdish and American people in the New York City and tri-state area. And now also starting to reach out and draw in more from Washington, D.C., all the way up to Boston uh, and ties with Nashville. Dallas, Chicago, and the Bay Area Kurds out in California. It's, it's very exciting, isn't it, that that the way we've been able to reach out to people. And I look forward to helping to build the New York um, Kurdish Culture Center with you in the future. As we have a little more time, Miles, can I ask you just one more bonus question? Um, always anything for you, Janet. Now that you're retired uh, from the Army, what are your plans? What are, What can we look forward to hearing from Miles Kaggins III in the future. Janet, since I my retirement ceremony in November, I've traveled to Iraqi Kurdistan three times. And while I'm there, I've attended a couple of geopolitical conferences. One was the Middle East Peace and Security Forum uh, hosted by the American University of 
Kurdistan. Another was the Erbil Forum hosted by the Erbil Research Center in, uh, in Erbil. And I will travel back there again in May, uh, likely in conjunction with a group of community leaders from Nashville, Tennessee, who are going to, to visit Kurdistan. Along the way, I'm um, talking to old friends. I've seen friends from Rojava who have visited into Bashur and also meeting business partners. I'm establishing a business that will do three things. One, language, specialized language and translation services. I want to match up the customer with the type of language talent that they need. For instance, if there is a a uh, woman who is an American and wants to, she wants to make a large real estate transaction in the hook in Iraqi Kurdistan. We want to give her a interpreter who understands the language of not just business, but the language of contracts and uh, architecture and, and real estate. So she, so the investor will have the, the, be able to win with words. My, my company is called the words warriors. Another thing my firm will do is uh, executive communication coaching. I want to help teach people how to talk on camera and give speeches so they can bring out their very best and connect and resonate with their customers, clients, constituents, or employees. And the last part of my business is business advising between American and Kurdish businesses, or even Kurdish to Kurdish businesses. I have the unique ability to bring people together uh, at high levels, low levels, and no levels, to have relationships based on trust and partnerships based on goodwill. And I'm formalizing some partnerships with a couple of, of Kurdish businessmen in Dehuk, and then another group in Erbil. And then I will hope to branch into Slomani and the next uh, couple of months. And these conversations are continuing to grow. We're converting the, the contacts to conversations and the conversations into contracts. And then we want to help uh, build a business and have revenue and put some of the money back into uh, culture and arts for Kurdish people. And I, I want to hire uh, Kurdish people. I have a couple of young interns at the University of Kurdistan Hilaire, and they're helping me write some documents and uh, do my business registration. And occasionally when you see me tweeting in Sarani or Arabic or Kermanji, those tweets and uh, messages are all written by friends who I've met in the region who help me maintain uh, relationships and grow the friendship between America and Kurdistan. Oh man, you know, you have hit the ground running after your retirement. Some people thrash around and wonder what to do. You are just plowing ahead and using all of your amazing talents and building on 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 what you've already achieved and turning it into in, incredibly useful projects. So I'm really I really want to um, salute you for your work and thank you for explaining that to us. Congratulations and good luck with your projects and we look forward to keeping in touch with you and hearing about them. Oh, Janet, thanks for all you do. I admire your work. Uh, I wish I could travel as extensively in Rojava as you have traveled. And I'm glad that we are able to work together coming from different spaces to advance the same goal from our same um, starting position of having goodwill toward the Kurdish community. Absolutely. Thanks, Miles. Bye-bye, everyone. Oh, happy.